First of all, can I thank you for the invitation um, uh, to come here this afternoon. I don't think it, it's untrue to say that this is probably the most informed audience on any topic that I have um, spoken to, certainly about our uh, Rebuilding Ireland or New Era document. And it is uh, very helpful for me as, as somebody who's trying to constantly improve this document. You'll see um, in a few minutes' time that this is a, essentially a somewhere between a green paper and a white paper for the development of um, a total restructuring of how uh, state companies in Ireland operate um, and how the, uh, the state, through government, can actually drive a change agenda that will benefit Ireland uh, in its current state uh, by driving investment through new state companies, by merging some existing state companies to achieve uh, a better dividend for the state, uh, and by uh, potentially selling off uh, state companies that are no longer of strategic interest at some stage in the future when the market is right to actually maximise the value of those state companies, uh, stroke state assets. Uh, and there have been a number of cynical responses to this document um, from people, in my view, who clearly haven't read it or else have read it and are trying to just dismiss it polit politically. Um, things like Fine Gael are looking to set up uh, a new super quango, uh, or Fine Gael are, you know, on the one hand saying that we need to reduce the number of quangos and state agencies uh, to save costs and drive efficiency, yet at the same time they're talking about setting up a whole new series of state agencies. That is not what we're, what, what we're proposing to do here. There is a fundamental difference between a state agency or a quango that is financed by the taxpayer and a commercial state company that needs to raise its own capital uh, and needs to get a commercial uh, uh, um, uh, return from that expenditure, uh, albeit over a longer period of time, in many cases um, in state companies rather than in the, um, the private sector. But fundamentally, all of the proposals that we are um, putting forward for discussion here um, are about the setting up of new commercial entities that will operate and compete in the private sector, but will do something that, in my view, the private sector does not have the capacity to do at the moment, which is to drive very, very significant capital investment in infrastructure in Ireland, key infrastructure, that will, be the, um, uh, that will provide the arteries for the new economy that needs to be created. And if you want to label that the green economy, that's fine, or the, or the clean energy economy. But I would just refer to it as the new economy, because not everything about it is green, but a lot about it is green. Um, and um, if you... If, um, let me just go straight on to this, because I think that I want everybody to understand what we're trying to do here first, and then I'll maybe talk about why... This, is, uh, uh, this model makes sense for Ireland at the moment. What we're proposing is that we would set up a new um, holding, industrial holding company that would own and be responsible for the performance of all state companies in Ireland, including the big successful ones like the ESB and Board Gosh, as well as um, the other smaller ones like Board Nimona, uh, and the many others that are there, Bus Air, Air Road Air, and so on. Uh, and the reason for that is that, at the moment, the, the semi-state sector is, is made up of some very successful and uh, um, impressive performing companies, uh, and some not so successful in terms of delivering for the state. Um, but what is absolutely clear is that the current structure is about individual companies creating sort of empires of their own to, to deliver a return for the state. Uh, and each of those companies is the responsibility of individual departments in government. Um, and so when the state wants to get something done in energy, um, the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources talks to the ESB because they're the biggest player. Likewise, if the Department of Agriculture wants to get something done in forestry, they talk to Coford or they talk to um, uh, Quilcha, who own 7% of Ireland's land mass. Um, and likewise, the Department of Transport speaks to... Uh, uh, companies like Bus Aaron and Aaron Road Aaron in relation to everything from you know introducing biofuel uh, uh, biofuel fuel into the fleet to to all sorts of other things. 
And we think that that is a really uncoordinated way of managing a portfolio of state companies. Uh, and we, we would like to see a, a holding company that would be directly responsible to the Department of Taoiseach and that government would make cabinet decisions, strategic decisions for the country, and then they would instill the responsibility on the new era holding company to deliver on that vision for the state through a portfolio of state companies and managing them as a portfolio that complement each other, that compete with each other, um, but that, but that at, at the end of the day, deliver for their shareholder, which is the state. And as opposed to having the, the, the approach that we have at the moment, which is one that is, very, that is all over the place in terms of policy development. Um, and uh, and that, is, that is the main idea behind a, a holding company that, that can actually set targets for big, strong companies like the ESB. And if those targets aren't delivered, there are consequences. A holding company that can, that can, um, uh, um, that can assess the performance of management and get rid of management if they're not delivering. Um, that, can, that can benchmark the performance of state companies against their competitors in terms of wage rates, in terms of, well, in the energy sector, it's, it's quite easy to do that, in terms of the cost of delivering on, uh, on energy targets, whether they be green energy targets or pricing targets or whatever. And so, in the same way that, that my party wants to try and reform the public sector, wants to try and re reform the way in which government decisions are made, and uh, the, the budgetary process, we also want to uh, fundamentally reform the semi-state or uh, state company sector in Ireland so that we have a, a structure that can deliver for a modern economy. Uh, and then within that new structure, we want to set up a number of new state companies that, that are specifically targeting key infrastructural projects for the future. And let me just... Use one of them as an example. Uh, next generation broadband provision in Ireland is a, is a huge stumbling block, block to progress for many businesses. Um, and the, the current approach towards it is uh, the market will solve this problem. Uh, when there's a demand for um, a broader bandwidth uh, and new products, uh, the market will find ways of delivering it through satellite broadband, through mobile broadband, moving to, to 4G maybe after 2012. Um, uh, there will be fibre rollout through metropolitan area networks and through, through um, a capital investment via Aircom and so on. But it's not working. Uh, and what, what we are saying is that you know, it is time that we had a state company with, with, with the specific responsibility of rolling out and managing a wholesale broadband infrastructure made up of fiber, copper, uh, as well as wireless products. Uh, and at the moment, the state already has a very significant amount of broadband infrastructure, but it's being managed hopelessly. We have um, a lot of infrastructure, for example, at the ESB, which they've rolled out along with, with other infrastructure that they already have in place, because it made sense to do it at the time. Uh, Borgosh have infrastructure, which they've rolled out with their pipelines. Um, the, the National Roads Authority has ducting infrastructure that can carry fibre. Much of it isn't used at all. Um, we have, so there is a, 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 and then we have a metropolitan area um, network of, um, I, I'm just uh, trying to get the exact figure, uh, of about 84 uh, fibre rings around towns in Ireland. Do you know that 59%, 59 of those 85 are fibre rings that aren't lit up and aren't being used at the moment? It cost the state 80 million euros to build out those 59 rings. And there isn't even a management contract in place to actually use them and get a return for the state. The first 15 are being used um, um, and are being managed quite effectively and are, and are giving a return to the state. So there is, a, there is a, a, a fundamental problem in terms of the coordination of all of the existing state-owned infrastructure, owned through state companies, but because of a total lack of coordination between state companies, we're not getting the kind of return on investment that we should be getting from the broadband infrastructure that's there. Um, and on top of that, we have Aircom, a, 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 a company that has almost 4 billion euros of debt, 
uh, around its neck, uh, as well as a huge uh, pension deficit problem um, that is, um, well, being considered for sale again to two, if not three, venture capitalists who want to buy it with a view to selling it again in four or five years' time to make a quick buck. Now, you know, it's about time that the state recognised its mistakes in relation to a company like Aircom, as well as recognise just how vital Aircom is to, to future next generation broadband delivery in terms of telecommunications infrastructure. And so what we're saying is, let's, let's put a state company in charge of this infrastructure, let's use that state company to actually purchase either Aircom as a company, or more importantly, the infrastructure that Aircom owns, which is for sale. Uh, um, and, uh, and in my view, which the state can get at a, at a considerably knockdown price uh, for a number of reasons, not, not least of which they can threaten that if, if they don't get uh, um, ownership of it, they're simply going to run out, a, a roll out, a, a duplicate network anyway that the state is going to pay for over the next 25 years. Um, so we'd like to see, you know, that, that's just one example of... Uh, a current policy which is not delivering. Uh, uh, more and more people are using broadband, but they're not getting the kind of bandwidth that they need. And Ireland is falling behind. Uh, and that must end, and the state must lead in actually changing that. Because the state can make investments that actually are based on a 25 to 30 year return. The private sector in general won't do that. And, you know, we have uh, um, private pension reserve, uh, uh, private pension fund money, uh, um, up to 6 billion euros is the estimate, willing to invest in uh, infrastructure and utilities in Ireland you know, that needs to be funneled through secure sources like this that we want to take advantage of. You, know, you can make the same case for water in Ireland. You know, 37 different local authorities manage the delivery <coughs> of clean water and the treatment of uh, um, uh, dirty water in Ireland at the moment. 37 different local authorities. The delivery of water is, is hugely expensive in Ireland versus uh, other countries in the European Union because of the way, in we, the way in which we manage and deliver it. And as a result of that, we're not getting the kind of capital investment that we need in water infrastructure in Ireland. So what, what we want to do is end that. We want to set up one body, a state company, that will, that will actually uh, um, manage Ireland's uh, water infrastructure as a country. Now, it is a fact that at some stage in the next 20 to 30 years, we will need to pump vast quantities of water from one part of this island, where, where, whether it be the Midlands or the North Midlands, uh, into Dublin to actually provide clean water here. Do you think we're going to be able to do that, dealing with each individual local authority, one after the other? Not a chance. The reality is we have to put a value on water as well. And at some stage in the future, in my view, domestic water charges will, will be inevitable again. And that's the one thing I'd rather you didn't quote me on today because <laughs> it'll become a big election issue if Simon Coveney is saying that as a spokesperson for Fianna Gael. But I think that, that at some stage, uh, um, it will make sense for homeowners to actually pay for water. And you know, I would like to see uh, every house in the country getting a quota for domestic water. Uh, and if they're over that quota, they pay, and if they're under it, they get a rebate from the state, because they're saving us money. And the actual, the, 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 the main benefit in terms of saving for the state will, will actually be a reduction in water usage, rather than the actual payment that they get. You know, it'll be a little bit like the plastic bags levy. You know, the, the state really makes nothing out of that. But they've, but they've fundamentally changed the way in which people carry their, their groceries. Uh, and water can be the same. So like this, this shouldn't be seen as another tax or a charge. Instead, it's seen as putting a value on something that people need to reduce their usage of. And it will encourage people to invest in you know, rainwater storage uh, tanks and all sorts of other things that can reduce their water usage. And it will you know, force people to wash their car with a bucket of water rather than with a hose. You know? And I mean, these are the kind of basic things that are the norm in other countries. Uh, but in Ireland, because everybody says, oh, well, there's so much rain in Ireland, water is free. So just use it away. Like about 30% of some local authorities' entire budget is spent on providing clean water and, and, and dealing with, with sewage treatment. 30% of budgets. It's enormous expenditure. Uh, and, and that's something that the state needs to resolve. Um, not least because local authorities cannot spend any money because they haven't got it at the moment. Uh, in terms of. So I'm just using two examples there. I, mean, I can make the same case in relation to bioenergy. You know, we're proposing, just in case you think we're, we're proposing to set up a whole new series of state companies and not actually 
you know, reduce the numbers to actually make up for that. We're not. We're proposing that Quilche, Bordnamona, and Coford would be merged into one forestry and biofuels company that would be called Biofuels Ireland. Um, you know, uh, uh, both both uh, Quilche and uh, and uh, Bordnamona are both going down the same avenue at the moment. They're both going into energy. They're both building wind turbines. They both have very ambitious plans to get into the energy market uh, through, through use of biomass, biofuels, uh, um, uh, wind, and so on. Uh, um, you know, we're phasing peat out over the next 15 years. We're not opening up any new bogs, and rightly so. But we can, you know, we can finish off the existing bogs that are currently open in terms of using peat as a fuel, even though it is a filthy fuel. But for political reasons, we need to do that. Um, not to introduce sort of shocks into the, into the economy in the west of Ireland and in the, the centre of Ireland. So, but I mean, it is a fact that if you speak to, to Board Namona, they are phasing out peat and they're looking at other opportunities. And it makes sense that we should be uh, um, merging the expertise in, company, uh, uh, in companies like Quilce and Board Namona to get the best of both and create a hybrid, essentially, that is about biomass and biofuel um, and a, it becomes a huge forestry land manager. Um, like we have a target of planting 20,000 hectares of trees every year in Ireland. That's our target. And what are we planting? 5,000. You know? And we talk about uh, you know, Ireland having a green future. You know, it's just not delivering. And that needs to change. And there needs to be consequences for non-delivery. Um, so, you know, that's what we're at. I, 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 can, I know Mwail would like to hear me talk about smart grid, maybe, and I'll, I'll talk about the energy sector maybe in a minute. But, so, let me just go back to, to the drivers behind this, this thinking. You know, I mean, we think that in the same way that, you know, the ESB was set up for a purpose. You know, Ardna Crusher was built for a purpose. And a lot of people said that the state was mad at the time, that it wouldn't work, it was too expensive. You know, we need now to, to create the structures and the vehicles to deliver for a new economy in Ireland. And, you know, we are about to go through, at best, three or four years of uh, recession in Ireland. Uh, and we should be using that period to actually put the, the infrastructure in place that, that when Ireland does turn the corner and starts to recover, that that recovery is a rapid recovery because people can plug into an advanced infrastructure that, that will allow Ireland to compete really aggressively with our closest neighbour in Britain, but also with other European countries and other parts of the world. You know, and those areas, in my view, are as clear as day. They are energy and energy costs they, uh, and energy security. Um, they are telecommunications infrastructure uh, and they are water infrastructure. Um, you know, if you talk to businesses at the moment, you know, their big costs are, are labour, electricity, water, and one of the big frustrations is access to telecommunications infrastructure, never mind the cost. Um, so it's cheap to build this infrastructure in recession. It's about you know, 20 to 30 percent cheaper to build it now than it would have been 18 months ago. Um, because people will compete far more aggressively in terms of tendering to this type of work. Um, you know, I, 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 so like, this is about trying to find opportunity in recession, you know, as opposed to just being obsessed with getting the public finances right on its own, you know, raising taxes, cutting expenditure, trying to close this 20 billion euro gap that Ireland simply can't sustain. You know, we accept that that's necessary. But in tandem with that, as well as solving a banking crisis, um, we, all must, we, we must also create jobs but, but, but try and use that job creation to create a more competitive economy on the whole by creating uh, um, new economies and new infrastructure that can deliver for us. Um, and so a lot of people have referred to this document as you know, Fine Gael's job creation strategy. Like, that's the byproduct of it. But the really important thing here is that in five or seven years' time, Ireland has a really competitive modern infrastructure to benefit from, a, a, that will result in economic growth that otherwise may not have been so rapid uh, um, uh, if we continue to stumble in terms of the infrastructure that we're trying to build. So, um, so like, there's a recognition here that, you know, that there is a public finances problem. And you know, I think as an opposition party, 
We've been pretty brave, actually, in terms of what we've said in this area, in terms of our willingness to cut expenditure, which hasn't been popular. Um, uh, and you know, I think we'll continue to be brave in that area, but, but we will insist on movement and imagination and ambition in other areas where there is no movement at all, um, rather than taking the view that's there at the moment that you know, the market will provide the infrastructure that we need. Or the ESB, uh, who, to be fair to them, are very proactive in, in terms of, uh, um, of the energy market. But my difficulty with that is that, is that the ESB is perhaps too influential in terms of how decisions are made, um, rather, than the, um, rather than the department um, uh, and the cabinet. Um, so we, you might ask, how much money are we proposing to spend on, uh, uh, through this new vehicle? Um, over four years, we're proposing to spend 18 billion euros as an economic uh, stimulus package. Uh, about 11 and a half billion of that is new money. Uh, the other, uh, uh, um, the, the remainder is is existing expenditure that has been committed to through the national development plan uh, in terms of infrastructural development. And one of the advantages of this is that we are proposing to take some expenditure away from direct government balance sheet expenditure away from uh, requiring government borrowing to deliver and actually to get that um, uh, delivery of investment uh, funneled through um, a new structure, new state companies that will actually go out into the market and raise money on their own through a new era um, uh, funding model. Um, with, and don't forget that nearly all of these uh, infrastructural areas, in fact all of them that we're proposing, are, are regulated markets. So, like the state controls the price, uh, uh, um, and you know, obviously we need to deliver a competitive price. But but it is a regulated market uh, in terms of um, telecommunications um, and in terms of electricity in particular, and water, um, <coughs> uh, 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 as will be the case certainly for water in the future. Um, so, I, I I think I've I've spoken about a lot of that already. Um, so these are, the, these are the state companies that we're talking about. Um, Smart Grid is essentially a, a, a further development of, of ESB networks. Uh, and to be fair to the ESB, they have responded to uh, a new direction from government in terms of trying to deliver on um, uh, the green agenda, um, trying, to get, um, uh, uh, trying to reduce Ireland's reliance on imported fuel um, and using wind and wave uh, as fuels, as well as biofuel and biomass and so on. And we're trying to build a grid that can actually facilitate that development now. And I know in a week's time or two weeks' time, you've got Spirit of Ireland in here, who, who I've spent quite a lot of time with as well. Uh, and they want to take it to the next level. You know, they want to say, you know, instead of Ireland having uh, a 40% uh, of our energy produced from renewable sources, which we're building a grid to facilitate, uh, we want Ireland to be 100% reliant on renewable sources at some stage in the future. In fact, we want Ireland to be a net exporter of green energy, green clean energy, through interconnectors to Britain, to France, uh, and into Central Europe. Um, and, and they believe they can do it by you know, uh, very, very large-scale uh, energy storage projects. Now, that, that theory needs to be ruthlessly tested before we would commit that kind of expenditure. But it's certainly very ambitious thinking that I don't think should be dismissed. By, uh, by people who are, who are following a, a route towards 40% um, renewable delivery. Because in my view, the, the difference between the infrastructure that's needed in terms of network infrastructure for, 40%, uh, for a 40% renewables target is an entirely different infrastructure than, than, than will be required to essentially link up three or four huge hydro projects that have raw, water reservoirs filled by wind turbines, which is um, essentially what they're talking about. It's a, it's a very, very different model. So we need to actually test the new model uh, and see whether we should be altering the way in which uh, Ireland's grid is being developed at the moment. Because you're, we're talking about billions of euros of expenditure here. The ESP is committed to about 12 billion euros of expenditure over the next 15 years. Um, and um, you know, that is a, that, uh, that's a very, very significant investment. But what Smart Grid is about is, is about essentially pushing ESP networks to be even more ambitious than they're being at the moment, uh, to, to facilitate uh, um, micro-generation, to allow um, particularly people living in rural Ireland and farms to develop 
um, uh, the capacity to generate their own electricity and to actually sell small amounts of electricity back onto the grid um, um, if it's feasible for them to do that. This is, this is normal practice in many, many other countries. And those of you who don't live in Ireland um, or, or have lived abroad uh, will know that it is. And if you look at what's happening in the UK at the moment, there's a huge drive towards decentralising power uh, to allow people to generate their own power. It's not always the most efficient and cost-efficient way to produce energy, but it is something that suits um, Ireland as a country because we have such a rural population. 40% of people in Ireland live in, in a, a rural environment. Um, one of the other really ambitious things that we want smart, a smart grid to deliver on um, is a, um, um, an electric charging infrastructure for um, electric vehicles. Um, like I've made a prediction that by 2020 there will be no cars, no new cars on sale that aren't driven by electric engines. And you can quote me on that in 10 years' time if you want. Um, but I, I think it, it will be a no-brainer not for environmental reasons or climate change reasons or anything like that. It will be a pure cost thing. If you compare a, um, a Renault Megane that's driven on petrol at the moment, it will cost you €10 Euros to drive 100 kilometres. If you compare that to an e Megane, which is driven on batteries at the moment, which is there and has been tested, it will cost you about €1.70 to drive 100 kilometres if you charge that battery um, at the low-cost period at night time. So we're talking about one-seventh or one-eighth of the cost of driving a car on electricity versus driving it on a fossil fuel like petrol or diesel. You know, and households you know, will save thousands of euros a year in terms of fuel costs by switching to electricity, and they'll never have to go to the garage again because they'll just plug in at home at night time. Um, at the same time, you know, if we can create a million... Like we have, we'll have two million cars on the road by 2020. Uh, and if we don't change, they will be contributing uh, 8 million euros of carbon into the atmosphere um, uh, 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 annually. It's about three, 3 tons per car, 3 or 4 tons per car, depending on the car. Um, you know, this can be Ireland's largest um, carbon em emission reduction project, bar none. If we were to... Uh, if we were to transform our car transport fleet as well as the, other, the rest of the transport infrastructure from fossil fuel to uh, electric delivery. Uh, and not only that, but, but this, this also creates a huge opportunity for the, the renewable sector uh, because one of the big problems with wind in particular is that it is an incons inconsistent source of power. So, you know, often a turbine is producing power at 4 o'clock in the morning when nobody needs it. But it's not producing power at five o'clock in the day when you've peak demand. So, so all of a sudden we are actually leveling out the demand curve. If we had two million cars charging between midnight and six o'clock in the morning, when there's a huge excess supply of power there, um, we could make life much, much easier for our energy companies and in particular our renewable energy companies because we are essentially creating an energy storage system in the transport fleet that are charging up at night time when there's excess power and they can get it cheaply, uh, and then they can use it during the day. Uh, and so we're creating the symbiotic relationship between the transport sector and the, uh, and the electricity sector that actually solves this peak and trough problem that AirGrid have to manage and that many uh, um, uh, energy companies find very, very difficult to deal with because, um, th because they're making money at peak times but they're losing money during, during the troughs at night time because they have to keep turbines spinning uh, on idle or whatever. So, um, do you need to go, Gareth, for your... I do. Okay, sorry. Kind of uh, uh, that's okay. I, I'm glad I, I was here. I don't want to keep I'm you trapped going. in there. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, like, there, there are a whole series of things that we're trying to do here that, that a, a modern electricity grid can solve in terms of, uh, the, the, I mean, and so many people will say to you that, you know, outside of the traded sector, you know, the, the, there are really only two sectors that count in terms of emissions. There, there's agriculture and there's transport. Um, and, you know, and transport is seen by many people as this huge problem that we can't resolve. Like, transport is the answer to our emissions targets, almost on its own, if we were to take a really aggressive approach towards shifting over to 
to um, electric transport because not only and I mean people might say to me oh, well hang on a second because a lot of powers a, a lot of that power is going to come from from fossil fuel sources I'm sure there'll be a few cars that'll be um, that that'll have their batteries charged by money point but maybe that's the case in the short term but the reality is it won't be the government's problem in terms of the targets that it's setting for itself because because that's the traded sector which takes care of itself and money point will have to ha will have to purchase carbon credits for all of the emissions that it produces um, so you know as you know the, the traded sector is a is totally outside of the responsibility of the uh, of the state in, in terms of the targets that we're setting for ourselves in the non-traded sector so you're shifting the burden from transport in the in the non-traded sector into energy generation in the traded sector which is a really attractive political thing to do in terms of meeting targets but even outside of that from an environmental point of view it makes um, uh, 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 the renewable energy proposition much more attractive because you are creating this essentially a massive battery that charges at night time that can use power uh, um, uh, um, at a time when there's huge excess power um, uh, generation capacity so you can use it later on during the day. Um, so you know, all of these companies have a, have a strategic role in the future. So whether it's the the smart grid, you know, delivering electric transport, delivering micro-generation, delivering cheaper power um, to people, whether it's Broadband 21, delivering on uh, telecommunications infrastructure, whether it's Bioenergy Ireland, merging two big companies at the moment to get the best out of both of them, you know, uh, whether it's Irish Water doing the same, uh, uh, Renewable Energy Ireland is a smaller company that, that we think needs to invest in startup uh, green companies. Um, or whether it's a greener bank that, that, that will allow the 1.4 million households in the country to spend money on upgrading their, um, their, their houses in terms of insulation, uh, um, uh, in terms of boilers, in terms of energy efficiency, uh, and so on. The reality is that you know, we have some attractive um, government-sponsored grant programs at the moment, whether it's the Greener Home Scheme, the Warmer Home Scheme, the House Insulation Scheme, but all of them require the household to actually... Um, you know, this is matching funding, so it requires households to actually borrow and spend money in order to access grants. And many of the households can't get that money at the moment. Uh, and we think that um, that a greener bank, and I know this is very strongly supported by SEI, um, that a state-run um, um, greener home bank, if you want to call it that, that that would provide very very competitive loan rates um, to households, would actually open up a whole new industry in upgrading um, homes from an efficiency point of view. Um, I'm anxious now that we, that we move on to questions, so, so maybe... So, so, so the, you know, what I would appeal to people on, just to finish, is this. You know, whether you agree or disagree with this approach, you know, I would, and the people in this room are very influential in terms of policy development and in terms of, of coverage of what different political parties are saying. But I would ask you not to dismiss it as saying um, that you, you know, raising money through state companies is just the same as raising money um, by, by the state borrowing. You know, that is just factually not true. Um, it, saying that, you know, sure, can't the ESP just deliver this? You know, like, that is saying, well, look, let's just stick with what we have. Like, there are times in history when, when the state needs to say, you know, hang on a second, let's reassess um, how our portfolio is performing. What, what does the state control at the moment? It controls state companies and it controls state expenditure through local authorities and through the agencies that are sponsored by the state. Okay? We are looking very seriously at cutting back expenditure and trying to review in which state agencies, uh, the way in which state agencies perform. But nobody is questioning how state companies are performing. And, and what we're saying is that state companies have served this country really well in the past in terms of you know, kick-starting economies within, within Ireland in the past, whether that's rolling out um, electrification into the countryside, um, whether it's the, uh, the telephone infrastructure that was rolled out successfully, uh, uh, or, or whether it was a big energy storage project or hydro project like, like Arden of Prussia. You know, now it's time to reassess again. You know, Ireland, uh, um, in my view, will never have an unemployment rate of less than 10% again unless we can uh, um, 
create a competitive advantage that, that we have here versus our competitor countries. And the areas where we can create that are, are in energy, uh, in transport, in water, um, and in particular in telecommunications. Companies will simply not come to Ireland if we're not competitive in those areas. Uh, and so let's use this crisis as an opportunity to rebuild or build anew the infrastructure that's going to be required for a competitive, successful economy in two and five and seven years' time. And in doing so, let's employ a lot of people to make that happen. Because God knows a lot of pe there's a lot of skilled people out there who, uh, um, who need employment at the moment uh, and who would happily work on projects like this one. And you know, the figure of 100,000 jobs has been linked with this proposal. The exact figure is 98,800 jobs. And that figure is based on an independent assessment of what we're proposing here um, in terms of uh, the expenditure of 18 billion euros over a four-year period and breaking that up into uh, um, uh, capital expenditure versus salaries and current expenditure and so on and the likely number of jobs that it would take to, uh, um, to, um, uh, um, to fill that purpose. And you'll see that calculation and the basis for it in the, uh, in the document if you, if you want to take one of them home. Um, with you at the end of this uh, discussion. So, like for me, the byproduct is jobs, even though it's a big selling point for this. But the most important issue here is that this is making Ireland competitive again when we've lost that competitiveness in all of the sectors that we are proposing that the state would take a direct, aggressive role in rectifying. Um, and the only way we see this happening in a coordinated way is if you have a holding company to actually manage the whole lot. Because otherwise, companies like the ESB get too influential, too strong. You know, already in my view, and I mean, this is a, this is a compliment really to the ESB. Like, the ESB have, have knowledge and capacity and the ability to write policy that is far, far ahead of the Department of um, uh, Communications, Energy and Natural Resources. You know, far ahead of them. Uh, and in my view, they run rings around that department when they choose to. Uh, and, and that's fine, you know, but, it, but, I, but I'd like to change that. Uh, and, uh, and I'd like the state to be setting the targets uh, and then having that, those targets delivered because the state is the shareholder. This isn't about the companies it's the, themselves. It's about delivering for the shareholder, uh, which is the state. Um, and and that's, that's how uh, we propose to reform the, the semi-state uh, sector um, to actually deliver for people. And the recession is an opportunity um, that, like, it would be impossible to have proposed this 18 months ago. Impossible. People would have, people would have dismissed it, saying, you know, what are you doing this for? Sure, they, you know, Bordash is flying, Bordemone is flying, uh, ESP are doing a great job. Um, but, but all of a sudden, in crisis, people accept that maybe there's a need for, for some radical change. Uh, maybe we should reassess how we're doing things. Uh, um, and, uh, and maybe we should reassess what is the point of the state having ownership of state companies at all if the primary purpose of those companies isn't to deliver on a strategic vision for the state and that's what we're at so uh, if, you have, uh, if you have any questions please feel free to ask anything and I mean, if I can't answer it I'll tell you um, but I mean I have uh, um, like I say this is, a, this is essentially somewhere between a green and a white paper it's not perfect and I'm sure you may, you may question some of the costings of it um, well, like I already have an issue myself with one section of it in terms of the, the biofuels element. Uh, I think there's an overemphasis on ethanol and not enough emphasis on biodiesel. You know, but, like, I mean, but I mean, this is nitpicking. I mean, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get across to you is that, that there is an idea here that is worth considering by serious people in Ireland um, that can drive the kind of change and, and competitiveness that, that we want to create. Yeah, Peter, I know. Questions now. So,